You're listening to Cards to the Moon, a podcast about trading cards from both a collector and investor perspective. We hope you'll stick around for the ride as we take a deep dive into the state of the hobby, share some hot takes, hopefully some useful advice and fun stories along the way. Hey, you're listening to the Cards to the Moon podcast. My name is Clark and with me for episode 24 is Hyung and John as always. Plus we have a special guest interview coming up later in the show and it's with Chris Costa. We'll get into his story in a bit, but he's a guy you might have already seen in the hobby with his Big Night Breaks production and his brand new Card Vault store right across from Gillette Stadium, home of your New England Patriots. So that's pretty impressive and we're excited to have him on the show. Uh, Quick thoughts on Chris, you guys. How did you kind of first hear about him? I actually uh, met Chris really early on in the hobby. Mm. Um, I guess uh, I guess before the whole hobby spike, and uh, this is when Instagram was really new, kind of to the hobby, <laughs> and everybody's kind of like making up their yeah. own accounts and then following each other who had baseball cards. And yeah, we started uh, talking, and uh, he played college baseball too, so that was kind of something in common. We kind of cool. gravitated towards, and we started talking, and then had similar interests, and then. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it kind of led to uh, just kind of seeing what he was doing uh, in the hobby. He started investing in like bigger cards, uh, and then he had questions whether you should hold and sell. I think one of them was like a, a Chrome Sapphire uh, Orange Tatis Auto. <laughs> yeah, he he had like a BJ. It was it was, it was massive, and he was like uh, uh, thinking <laughs> whether to, to sell. hold. Sell. <laughs> I was like I was like hold. He was he was he was all about like selling it but i didn't yeah. i think he ended up selling it um but we we could ask him <laughs> uh yeah. I, I i don't remember what he actually did but uh, and then he it was interesting because he he was a guy that i always uh was seeing him evolving with with random mm. stuff so he would uh first say he was up to something and then next thing you know like big night sports break would you know um he would basically have that up and running so it was cool to kind of watch i guess uh from when he started to kind of seeing what he was doing mm-hmm. and now he opened i guess the card vault and then having like people like uh you know celebrities on his uh, big night breaks mm-hmm. and and whatnot it was it, it's pretty That's crazy cool. to see within the last yeah, yeah. couple of years what he's doing so he's definitely uh a, an interesting guy i guess to to pick his brain because he he's seen mm-hmm. it all uh, so that's how we kind of um, met, and then I kind of reached out to him when we talked about who who we could have uh, on on the show on the pod, and he was a perfect guy. I I thought uh, a perfect candidate because he's kind of like down to earth, yeah. uh, and he's he's actually doing stuff right. So it's like he's a guy that's kind of creating, um, you know, future timelines, es- essentially uh, things that never sure. existed, right? So sure. to me, I gravitate towards that. I respect kind of like uh, the entrepreneurship of 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 his mindset so it's uh it's neat to definitely have him on and i'm looking forward to to picking his brain for sure yeah awesome how about you john yeah for sure well i only know his name through you guys like when he chatted about yeah. chris in the past but I'm, I'm excited to hear from the guy like i i think one thing that i'm uh uh you know i i looked up look up to him in terms of like what he's accomplished he's he's literally like one of us he's one of the older heads I used to to collect in the '90s or or whatever, and he is somebody that basically walks the walk. You know, like we all dream of saying, "Oh, we should do this." Oh, I love the hobby. We should start this, or we should try this, or you know, whatnot. And he's a dude that literally is doing exactly what he's talking about. So I think that's something yeah. that um, is pretty neat to see, and I'm pretty excited to to ask him some questions. I think it's like yeah. literally three startups in the last two years. Um, Crazy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like, which is, him, which is nuts. Right. But yeah. that just shows you like the industry uh, is, is, is that big. It's, and it's ever evolving. Right. So it's uh, yeah. there's where, where there's evolvement, there's uh, opportunity. Right. So I think uh, people like that just kind of like jump on those opportunities and seeing where, the, where it kind of takes them and onto the next. Right. right. So. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I'm pretty excited. Like like you already mentioned, I probably first saw him on social media with his big night breaks. Like right. no one was doing breaks like he was at that time, like this big production. So so that was pretty cool. He kind of put himself on the radar fairly quickly, I think. 
Yeah. And um, like you said, he's just continuing to evolve and grow with the hobby. So that's kind of cool to see as well. But before we quickly go into that interview and welcome Chris to the pod, there was an interesting post from Card Porn this past week about breakers who give themselves the best team slots in the break while making all the other slots available for anyone who wants them. You know, there are strong reactions in the comments from both sides, right? But some, you know, some collectors think it's unethical. I would say the majority of the comments lean toward that opinion. And uh, actually, Carpoint, right before we started recording this, put up a new post with a poll that they did. And they mentioned 80 plus percent um, did think it was unethical or had a problem with breakers doing that. While others think it's fair game as a business as long as they are transparent about it. So quickly, I just wanted to see what, what did you guys think? I know this had a strong reaction from the hobby community. So your thoughts? I think as a as a public like breaker, if you're a breaker, yeah, that's a big no no. I think there's there's mm, some yeah. you know ethics and morals, and because uh, there's there's a large chance that you enter these breaks and you hit nothing, right? And then all of a sudden you're in a situation where oh the the person hosting the break is essentially you know winning, right? And 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 then it just there, there's no positive that could come out of it, especially when we're, we're, uh, you know, almost living in a digital era, right? So everything's done on on camera. So it's like all of a sudden, you know, uh, the the host hits something big, and then everybody skunks out, right? So I think right. I think it's okay in a private setting when you have a group of like, let's just say your boys, right? And then you're like, okay. Uh, who wants to join a break? You know, I'm taking these teams. Anybody interested? I think from that perspective, it's it's. I think it's okay, but I think if you're a public breaker, I think that's a big no-no. And it's always been that way. Um, and like you can't enter your own breaks, just just how it is, right? So, <laughs> okay. <laughs> mm-hmm. okay, interesting, mm-hmm. Johnny. Yeah, I mean, I I don't know what the, the truth is to some of the stuff that Card Porn put, if it's legit facts. But based on what he said, you know, if somebody were to to do a break and his buddy who is on a different Instagram account comes in and purchases a slot for one of the best yeah. teams um, and they don't disclose that. I think that's, you know, it's a, it's a shady. Yeah. It's a little shady. It's not horrible, but it's a little shady. And then, you know, if you reserve the best teams for yourself, like all of this, basically you just need like, like Young said at the beginning, you just need full disco- disclosure. I think if you disclose yeah. everything, you know, this break is coming 2019 prism, I'm taking New Orleans at a cost of this much. Here are the remaining teams. If people knew that, I think they would price in their head accordingly the odds and all that stuff, and they'll go into the purchase. I think that's that's all it is. And, you know, if anything comes out of the card porn, um, his latest post about, I think, like 85% of people, you know, looking at the post voted on, yeah, it's shady. For any breaker out there, I think it's a good learning lesson. Um you know, for the market is like, if you, if you're not transparent or if like, like Young said, I think you should take on the rule that the breakers shouldn't enter their own breaks, right or wrong, ethical or not ethical. Clearly the market sees it as negative. So that's just going to affect your business, man. Like in the end, if your business takes that negative, you know, negative hit like that, that's going to hurt you in the long run. So Mm -hmm. it's just smart not to just don't even bother. Like, yeah, make, make that policy friends family myself i don't enter my own breaks and then go from there i think that's just the cleanest right okay yeah no i i generally agree with you guys um but i think if they're transparent totally transparent that they're taking the best spots and they pay for it right um i think it's fair for a business you know i think even that poll that carport did i think it asked do you think it's fair that they take the best slots or give it to their friends and family like that second part um, I think would skew most people to say, no, it's not fair. Like, I don't agree with them giving it to friends and family because, you know, you can hide that fact a little bit more, right? right? You, right. You, it doesn't say like such and such breakers have spot number 25 or for the Charlotte Hornets during the Lamella Ball rookie year, right? And, right. and so I think there's um, there can be abuse of that if, if they give it to their friends and family. But if they're straight up about it, then... Then I don't have an issue with it. Like you can join that break, or or you don't have to. Yeah, like that'll that be up to you. Right up front, totally. Right, like hundred percent. It's like a, but at the same time, I do agree with what you said too. If 
if it's a negative perception, like, like, you know, if I'm a buyer, um, and I'm like, Oh, these guys actually take the best spots. I don't, I don't even want to go into their breaks. Like I, I'd rather go somewhere else where they have a rule that said they don't enter their breaks. Right. Then it's, it's better business for that breaker. Um, I'm, I would assume that they would also adopt a similar policy saying like, we don't enter our own breaks to get more customers or clients. Right. right? So like, so, you know, as a business, you can do whatever you want as long as you're open and transparent, but it, in, it might be a good business move based on the comments we've been seeing to make it a rule that you don't enter your own breaks. Right. Yeah. So I agree. And I, I think, think the- uh, like, do you know, like, uh, 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 eBay, for instance, they, they close out some auctions for teams in breaks, right? right. So I think yeah. eBay is more prone to stuff like that because, like, for instance, like if I'm in a Facebook group and, you know, for instance, Pr- Pristine uh, Breaks, they do a lot of Bowman uh, Bowman product. And and basically uh, it, it's, it's, it's a preview post and then at that time they're going to post and it's first come, first serve. So it's trans- very transparent. Everybody's on Facebook anyway, so you know everybody's mm-hmm. participating. Um, yeah. And it's a clean way of kind of knowing that, um, you know, the, the breaker's not participating, right? Because all teams are available and everybody's has a chance at getting it. It's first, it's pick your team, basically your, the, the format. But on eBay, what I was saying is a lot of these breakers, what they do is they'd buy a case or not. Sorry. I, I, I'm not going to say a lot of these breakers. Some, what some breakers do mm-hmm. is they'll buy a case and then they'll pick their teams and then sell off the rest of the remaining. Right. You wouldn't know. Is what right. I'm saying, no right? Idea. So it's like, yeah. yeah and so that, that's, you're not being yeah. transparent. So that's yeah, right. I, I'm totally against that. Yeah, for sure. yeah. But you wouldn't even know if uh, he, yeah. he was. Yeah, they were doing yeah. it. So I think that's a way that they can kind of like just put it yeah, out there. And you it. would you would never know actually mm. because you're just joining the live break after you win the eBay auction and you right. think, hey, you know what? I paid for Atlanta Braves, right? And then <laughs> you have no clue that you're just you know filling in spots, right? So yeah, yeah. yeah. It's definitely a polarizing topic. I'm not sure there's a clean resolution to it, but basic piece of advice I think we can all agree on is just do your research in the break that you're entering and then right. then you should be good. Yeah. Okay, without further ado then, instead of hobby headlines today, we'll move on to our interview with Chris Costa of Costa Cards and of Big Night Breaks. Hey Chris, welcome to the podcast. We're glad to have you on. Just before we get into a few questions, I just wanted to let our listeners know who you are for those who still haven't seen you on the various social media channels and around the hobby. Chris is an entrepreneur from the Boston area, and he's a sports car dealer, aka Costa Cards on Instagram. He's also a partner with Big Night Breaks, which is where I personally first heard of you, Chris. And, uh, you know, their high production breaks really set them apart from other breakers, in my opinion. And as part of Big Night, Chris and his partners just opened a hobby retail 1600 square foot store called Card Vault across from Gillette Stadium, home of the New England Patriots. And if that wasn't enough, Big Night is having its Causeway Card Show at the historic TD Boston Garden on January 8 and 9. So if you're in the area, go check it out. Hope I got all that right. Yeah. What an intro. <laughs> Amazing. Wow. Clark has a journalism background. I do. Former journalist for 15 years. <laughs> you, hear it, you hear it all out loud and it's like, God, we have too much going on. <laughs> no, it's, it's awesome. Well, Chris, you know, welcome. Thank you guys for having, yeah. having me. Super excited to be here. Obviously, respect everything that, that the three of you have done and the businesses that you've built. So uh, definitely looking that. forward to this conversation. Excited to, to kind of dig in with you guys. Appreciate that. Yeah. And when we started this podcast, one of our goals was to start connecting with influencers in the hobby like yourself to talk about your journey and also pick your brain on some hobby issues. So first, maybe a good place to start is how did you get into the hobby? You know, did you collect as a kid like all of us here and then get back into it during the recent hobby resurgence? Yeah. Tell us your story. My story is unique but also not so new, unique now that we hear everybody's story. <laughs> um, I, I collected my whole life. I've been a collector my whole life uh, ever since I can remember, you know, ripping packs in the backseat of my mother's car. She'd drive me out once a week to the local <laughs> hobby shop and, and I'd grab whatever, you know, my allowance would afford and, and I'd, you know, rip. And this yeah, was like yeah. in the 90s when, you know, I was chasing like Nomar Garcia Para. And- <laughs> 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 Love it. Uh, 
you know, so unfortunately, a lot of the stuff that like I accumulated as a kid is just really not worth much. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like it, it just kind of went on my collecting journey from there and uh, fell out of it, right? And and you know became more focused on on physical sports, mm. um, and you know was an athlete growing up and and continued to play baseball through college and um, you know fell out of not love with the hobby, but fell out of focus with the hobby until about four years ago, um, where I dove back in and, and it was like the it was really Bowman that yeah. brought me back into the hobby and, and prospecting and chasing prospects and the exciting, you know, prospect class too, yeah. that we've had over the last four or five years. Um, and, you know, then it just snowballed and continued to snowball as it has for so many of us, right? We were super fortunate to be in the space that we are a, um, mm-hmm. and super fortunate to have had this industry, have the, the trajectory that it's had over the last four, you know, four or five years. Um, but yeah, that's, that's really where it started, where it picked back up. Um, and you know, of course, uh, since, you know, the, the day I got back in, things have just continued to, to grow and grow and grow and grow yeah. and as the market grows, our collections grow. And as our collections grow, our interest grows. And, um, you know, we're very fortunate to have all of the talent that we have in all of the major sports right now. Um, uh, but yeah, that's, that's where, uh, or how I got back into the hobby and, and really to where things are today, which is nice. You know, yeah, as you mentioned in the intro, it's sort of getting out of control. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's a lot of those points that you made are very similar to our back backstories. So, totally, totally hear you. It seems you dive deep into the hobby fairly quickly when you got back in, just by seeing like all the investments you've made, especially through the production of Big Night Breaks. Were you that bullish? Were you that confident? that the hobby would continue to grow at that point? Or did you just think that you would go for the ride and see what happens? Yeah, I, I think I'm definitely have been confident and, and bullish on sports cards and, and collectibles for that matter mm. um, for, for a while. Right? And, and I think, you know, the, the, the moves that I've made and the partnerships that we've formed and the businesses that we've built are just kind of a manifestation of that confidence. Yeah. Um, you know, I think realistically, when I, when I look back a year or two years from now, where my head was at at that time, you know, we were going into the pandemic and things were in question, right? right? Mm-hmm. We saw this, this trajectory heading into the pandemic that was, you know, pretty linear, but, but growing. And then if you guys remember, we, we kind of saw sports shut down and we were all like, oh no, you know, what mm-hmm. have we put yeah. all this money yeah. and invested all this money into these That's players? Right. Yeah. that they're not even going to be on the field like we're we're in trouble <laughs> yeah and it was the complete opposite and yeah. people start started throwing their money into Seriously. this industry into this hobby and my confidence continued to grow hmm. um and that was you know i think it was part what you mentioned taking a chance and just wanting to do this as a career and full time yeah but also having confidence in the in the industry um, you know, there, there's so many different factors that, that boil into that confidence that yeah. we can talk about, but yeah, I think it's a mix of both. There's definitely some chance taking, you don't, mm, you don't sure. build businesses without taking chances. Um, mm. but also just bullish confidence in, in everything that we do. Nice. Can I ask you, what did you do before you went full time into the hobby? Yeah, I, I've, I've been and, and spent my career in, uh, technology, um, and specifically in sales. So I've, I've mm. spent the last decade in enterprise software sales, working with large technology companies and banks and uh, what have you, all different types of companies, mm-hmm. um, putting solutions in place uh, from a software and technology perspective. So um, have worked for big technology companies, have worked for small startups, um, and you know have been super fortunate and, and blessed throughout my career to have found success um, you know, and, and been in positions to be able to take chances. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I think part of the things that I've learned in my career and in my ability to, you know, uh, articulate messages and put together proposals and negotiate and find opportunity, um, have translated really well into sports cards and always sure. have, right. So ever since I got back in, mm-hmm. um, so I think, you know, uh, there's certainly some things that I've gleaned from my career that have lent well, uh, into the things that we're doing today. Yeah, definitely shows. Yeah. So as we mentioned off the top, you guys just opened up a 1600 square foot hobby shop, which looks amazing, by the way. Um, it does, now when yeah. almost, yeah, now when almost every business, not just in the hobby, but across industries are looking to close brick and mortar stores and go completely digital, 
You went the other way. Why did you guys want to open a physical space for your sports card business? Yeah, I, I think there, there's a bunch of different reasons. Um, you know, our story as a, as a company uh, started with breaking. Right? Mm. We started with a digital experience for our consumers and we built the following and a digital following and built digital experiences that we tried to make different than anything that was offered out there. And we had some success doing that, right? We were able to uh, to intertwine, you know, nightlife and entertainment and celebrities and athletes into the sports car world from a breaking perspective. Um, and that's really, we saw big night breaks, which you mentioned earlier, which was, our, is our, our breaking platform, um, have some quick and, and, you know, exciting success, mm -hmm. which proved that big night as a company, which is the largest nightlife and entertainment company in the country. We have 17 venues, uh, you know, some of the wow. biggest, wow. and, in top nightclubs and bars and restaurants in the world. Yeah. Um, you know, we decided that uh, big night breaks had proven that sports cards and nightlife and entertainment could exist together. Um, and that's where myself and my partners uh, at big night decided to go all in. Hmm. And, and we wanted to provide an experience an end to end experience that gave the consumer the ability to do everything sports cards with us under hmm. one roof. Um, and a big part of that, that I have always firmly believe is putting something physically out there that the consumer can touch, um, is super important and it grounds the brand, it grounds the business and helps build community around the business. And card vault is our physical manifestation of that idea yeah. and gives our customers a place to congregate, to buy, to sell, to trade, to get things graded that they may break with us to come and meet us and our team um, and is really kind of this uh, a central part of this end to end experience that we're building that is 100% digital. It, mm. We don't we don't want to get away from our digital presence, but also now physical and the, the card stores, uh, this being the first one at Patriot Place. Yeah. Yes, we want to do sales in the store and yes, we want to have sales and have successful revenue. Um, but it's more so an opportunity to get our brand out there mm -hmm. uh, than anything. So that's, yeah. that's really the, the, the high level idea behind it. Okay. I love that play. And I, I heard that you guys are thinking of opening a couple more stores. Yeah, we've got some pretty lofty plans. Um, <laughs> our second location will be open in December. Uh, nice. wow. and that is that, uh, at TD Garden, which is where our Causeway no will be. Um, we're super excited about wow. that. We have a third location in the works and then potentially a fourth location in the mm. works, which poses obviously tremendous challenges from, you know, th this is not an industry or a business that has generally scaled really well. Right. right. You know, brick and mortar, local card shops. Yeah. It's tough. <laughs> you, you inventory management, order management. How do you manage all these singles across multiple locations on right. top of the wax? Um, but we have a recipe that we think is super scalable, like beyond four stores. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, 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 really the, the crux of that is technology. And you have to have good right. technology, uh, you know, tying in my background uh, from yeah. a technology yeah. perspective and have good systems in place that can allow you to do that. But yeah, Card Vault's growing. There's going to be multiple locations. It's super important locations uh, yeah. that we're super excited about. That's awesome to hear. Yeah. And I, I know on Instagram, I saw that you got Robert Kraft to come to your opening. How, how did that happen? Did you just asked him? Yeah, I no, just asked him. I gave him a call <laughs> and, and asked him to come down. Um, no, so B Big Night, as I mentioned, is you know leader in nightlife and entertainment. Mm -hmm. We have many, many locations. It's a very large business. And uh, Mr. Kraft, Robert is, uh, is a friend of Big Night. He's one of our, uh, you know, investors and believes in our businesses and supports our businesses, including Card Vault. Hmm. Um, you know, he, he has been super supportive of Card Vault. Obviously, he is our landlord, um, <laughs> right. place, uh, but more importantly, a friend to our core business, which is Big Night. Um, and, you know, him supporting us is super important to us. Um, it's, we obviously build credibility with his support, um, him being here for our ribbon cutting has helped us build credibility. Yeah. He's obviously a very influential figure in the sports world. Um, so we're super blessed, uh, to have folks like him and, and many others that are very influential in the sports world, be friends mm -hmm. of ours. 
Um, and that's one of the reasons that I thought it was worthwhile taking a chance and partnering with Big Night because the resources that Big Night has and the, the friendships and the relationships and the network that Big Night has makes so much of what we're doing so much more possible. Right? Yeah, right. Yeah. And again, on Instagram, I've seen some of the connections you've already made through Big Night Breaks. Um, some very impressive A-listers, like you mentioned Steve Aoki, uh, Kraft, who we're talking about, and Shaq, I think I saw you with. Um, <laughs> was there anyone you were particularly stoked about meeting in person? Yeah. Um, well, first off, it's always exciting uh, to be with Mr. Kraft. He's mm. got an aura about him. He's obviously an incredibly powerful person and incred incredibly influential, incredibly successful, incredibly intelligent, all of those things right. are going on and on. Um, so that's always, you know, a, a, an experience. Um, Steve Aoki is, is a really good friend of ours and has been super supportive. And Steve is, uh, is, you know, electric a human as you'll, as you'll meet. Yeah, for sure. But of, of all the people that we've done anything sports card related, uh, I would say I would, mo I was most excited uh, to spend time with Dana White. Um, oh, wow. Okay. Interesting. When <laughs> UFC prism came out, yeah, we sure. were fortunate to be the first people to, to break it with him. Um, awesome, so I broke man we broke a box of UFC prism hobby with him on release day um, on our live stream. And, you know, Dana's another friend of the business and somebody that's obviously super influential and super powerful and all of those great things. But yeah, that was just a really cool experience opening UFC prism with the owner and the president. Right. of UFC. <laughs> Unreal. Unreal. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. That's crazy. Do you remember getting any big hits when you, when yeah, you any it? decent autos? <laughs> <laughs> we pulled a George St. Pierre auto, which was super oh, no cool. way. We in Canada blue, here. We pulled a Blue McGregor, which was sweet. Wow, that's um, sweet. But more so just like the conversation of, of the not so big hits. Like hmm. we pull out fighters and he's like, oh, they're on my card this weekend. They're on our card next oh, week. Oh, no way. Yeah. Um, it was just a really cool experience. And, you know, Dan is such a, an engaging guy and just like larger than life that um, that was just that, that one. I got off the live stream and I looked at my team and I was like, that was <laughs> too cool. That was yeah. one of the coolest things I've ever done. So nice. yeah, pumped about that. That's pretty sweet. I also want to ask you, we've seen the hobby change so much, even in the past few years. How do you think the hobby will evolve in the future? Or maybe what would you like to see in the hobby as it continues to grow? Yeah, well, I mean, we obviously see so many big announcements and big shifts and big things yeah. coming and changes in our industry. Um, I think technology is number one. The more we can introduce technology into our industry, the more that we can rely on technology in our industry, the more that we can get good data in our industry, right? From an investor's perspective, if I'm out there buying cards, the better, the more data I have at my disposal, the better decisions I can make, the, the more, uh, the better systems that I have that I can leverage, the more scalable my business is, you know, the more uh, opportunity there is from a technology perspective, the more investment comes into our industry. Hmm. Yeah. Um, so I think that's the most exciting part. Uh, and what I think is really the biggest opportunity for change is technology. You yeah. know, there's no true order management system and inventory management system that's designed for sports cards, right? Yeah. We are piecing together different solutions to come up with a solution that's friendly to sports cards. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's no... Uh, perfect analytical tool right now to help with markets, right? There's good ones and some do some things better than others, but none of them do everything perfectly. So there's, in, there's opportunity there. Um, the grading companies yeah. continue to, you know, invest in technology and add technology to their stack. And that's a big opportunity. And I think something that's going to transform our industry um, and with that, and with all of that opportunity, whenever there's gaps and opportunity for investment in technology, we're going to start to see big money come in, right? right. That's, we're going to start to see big investment. And that's where our, our hobby, right. That we all have fun <laughs> in becomes an industry, which right. it already has, right? Like the numbers that are out there are insane. The market Crazy. is half the market valuation. We're an industry and we're a, a legitimate industry, right. but you start to see private equity, you know? Yeah large scale investment, big tech, big names. That's where we start to become what we really deserve to become, um, which I think is super, super exciting. Yeah, no, I agree 100%. Um, I, I, I've used my excuse as a journalist to ask all the questions, but I want to open it up to Hyung and John. Do you guys have any, any questions you want to ask Chris? Well, one, 
Um, I remember back back when we started talking about your you're wondering if you should sell that uh, that orange Tatis uh, Sapphire Auto, <laughs> whether you should hold or sell. I remember, I, re- I remember that conversation. We, I, we all have our I, L's, right? No, no, no. <laughs> I, 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 Chris, I honestly don't know uh, what you ended up doing with that. We kind of just oh, okay. let let that happen because I I was I was like, man, that's a huge huge card. Like that's a big, big time card, right? So I didn't know what you did with it. So we talked it, about it earlier on the show, and I was like, you know what? That's a question I gotta ask <laughs> right, him. What, right. What'd you do with that? <laughs> gone. <laughs> it's gone, eh? You sold it, eh? Oh, uh, sold it right around when we were talking about it. And that was like my first big sale. Up until right. that point, I had just sure. poured. I was right, yeah, yeah. And it was cards in, no cards out. And that right. was like the first outside of like eBay listings on lower end stuff and moving through some of like the commons and the base. Um, that was my first big hit that I pulled mm. out of a pack that I missed. That's crazy. That's um, crazy. But, you know, at the time, ironically, at that time, and, and we're talking about the, the the 2019 Sapphire Fernando Tatis rookie autograph. I graded it. It was a 9 5 10, beautiful card out of mm. 25. Amazing. Um, and like, that's when Tatis's market was as hot as it, it was the right. hottest sure, market yeah. on the planet. Yeah. Yeah. Little yeah. did we know that, you know, <laughs> that right. time was a, a $3,500 card and right. one of the bigger cards out there was mm. probably going to be a fifteen to $20,000 card, if not more. Right. Yeah. Um, but what, what helped me move it was I actually got incredibly lucky. I opened the box at Topps Chrome and I pulled the orange wave rookie. Right. Auto. That's, that's what nice. we were talking about. Yeah, oh, that's yeah. crazy. There you go. And and you you had a record sale on that one. Yeah, like that that that's that was the that was a big time sale. And that's that fire I sold for like three grand. Mm. Uh, and I look back and it's like, but now you know you go through enough cards where it's just like you gotta you gotta take your lumps and keep moving, right? Yeah, and a sale, right. sale Absolutely. Profit, 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 Good advice. Take Good advice. Off the, off the tape. Um, but then the orange wave I sold privately. For I, I think it was twenty two thousand five hundred. That's um, nuts. I had that wow. card. That's the that was my dead wrong card. I sold that at like fourteen hundred. <laughs> so the, when, when you went like this, that was me. I had the PSA. It was a pop three. I I I, I panic sold right 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 during that time of the COVID the right? injury or the back injury. Yeah. One of those no 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 no. no that, it right? was it was it was before that. This was when uh, uh, COVID uh, the the shutdown happened. This is when sure. you were talking about it. Yeah. So that's when I panic sold. I sold the, the <laughs> I sold the sapphire uh, the Cunha sapphire to Phil Hughes. And then I sold that orange wave, and I, I that's the one I regret. I sold that, and I was just like, "Good God!" Yeah. And I remember you told me you you and I connected early on. Um, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, I got back into this as a baseball collector. Baseball's always been my first love. I played baseball. I know you played baseball. Yeah. Um, and you know, I was always kind of envious of you know your collection. You had built up such an amazing baseball collection, and you know, continue to bring in great cards. If I remember correctly, you. You were heavy on Vlad, right? You brought in a bunch of Vlad. I the- did. <laughs> yeah. I did. Yeah. I, I told you. I yeah, for me, you remember that I was I was buying Vlad and everybody was off of him. I'm saying this guy's way too cheap. Well, I just know. loaded. I absolutely <laughs> loaded up on Vlad. Yeah. Good That's move. funny you remember that. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, Tatis has has come and gone through, you know. Listen, I I, I certainly have, have taken this thing to, to a, you know, level after level after level and i've mm. i've gone from per- personal collection to you know dealer as a personal dealer but you know buying selling and trading at more of a, of a rapid clip to then building a business around it and now it's a business with right inventory and, and i look at things differently and it's funny how that happens when you when you start uh, a business not that any of what any of us are doing isn't a business but when you start a brick and mortar business mm. um the way you look at the cards changes. Now, you know, I, I certainly maintain a PC. Right. And you know, I continue to yeah. maintain several cards that I, I own, you know, I, I own all the cards with my team, but, you know, there's some that I just, that are mine. Right. And they're always <laughs> right. mine. Right, right, right. Um, and those are typically like on the Brady side of things just because of where we are. Sure. Um, but it's funny because the way you look at the invent- uh, cards changes, they become inventory and it becomes the, the lifeblood of your business. You have right. to go through it. Right. And you reinvest the money or you trade up or trade down. Right. And your inventory and your collection takes on a mind of its own. 
Yeah. Um, so that's been super interesting to watch. But like, you know, the things like the Brady contenders. Ooh, damn. Oh my gosh. Damn. Brady refractor. Oh my Jeez. gosh. That that's, refractor is sick. It's a beauty. That's my, that's that's my absolute favorite. <laughs> yeah. um, the curry refractor. Yeah, there it is. Oh man. Curry, man. So some pretty sweet stuff yeah. that I'm super excited about. Um, you know, we have, oh, have plenty of other really cool stuff that we can hit on quickly, but um that's that's like what's changed the most. What's been fascinating to me is because as a collector, when you and I first connected, you know, my the way I looked at cards was so different than it is right. now, because now I see how it's okay to move on from things, mm, right? Because there's always going to be other cards that I'm going to love just as much, unless they're you know, sure. Brady, Brady refractor. <laughs> right? right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. Uh, It is interesting how how I look at cards now versus how I did even a year ago, right? So yeah, I always that's, think yeah. that's amazing. No, that's that's good advice because that's that's the whole point. It's always progressing and you know growing that stack of inventory that you have, right? Whether you're trading up, you're always trying to you know improve your your portfolio, your hand. Right. And I think that's part of the hustle. And I, I totally see it like you're probably looking at it in a total, total uh, different perspective. But at the end of the day, it's probably something that you've never thought you'd you'd probably get into, like the, the fifty thousand, hundred thousand yeah. dollar cards. Crazy. That's in, that, that's when Insane. it starts getting real. Right. So, yeah, it does. Yeah. But like, you know, there's there's different pockets of this business. Right. Like mm -hmm. when when we're collecting, we look at things from an investment perspective. Right. Right. Um, and we're looking at things. OK, this is a three month hold. This is a six month hold. This is a year right. hold. Hmm. And when you start to look at things from like a dealer's perspective, right, when you're going to shows and moving through inventory, it may be a, a quicker clip than you were as a private, in, you know, collector right. or investor. For um, sure. You know, you still want to have some of those plays. Right. You still want to have a portion of your inventory towards investment right and you want right. to look at things in time the market yeah. um but you also have a portion of your inventory that's got a cycle and right. you know even if i think you know even if i think a uh you know kyler murray ntrpa is that's sweet you yeah. know i think a kyler murray or ntrpa is a good six month hold but if i bought it three months ago and i can make a 20 a 40 a 50 percent profit well, that's money I can reinvest into more Kyler money. Right. Or yeah. What have Makes you, sense. Right? Yeah. Makes uh, sense. So there, you know, it becomes a, a portion of this business and my business is still very much centered around the things we did a couple of years ago, a few right. years ago, where it's okay, let's let's put some money into Tatis, let's put some money into Vlad or Acuna. Yeah. Uh, but then, you know, portions of it are just it's out. My my yeah. cards are out, and somebody walks in and they say, "Hey, I'll take that card. It's theirs." Right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Very yeah. different from that. Hundred percent. Yeah, no, it's literally it's scalable what you're doing, uh, just on a you know a, a, a way bigger level, right? And it's <laughs> it's a place where people are willing to emotionally buy too, right? Once they're in the place, they have this uh, feeling of you know what, this, I'm, I'm going to do it. There's no other place that I would drop twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 or, you know, trade in my high end cards to, you know, liquidate. And then you, you have a setup where you could, you know, um, basically monetize on it. And that's, uh, that's amazing. You could do that on that kind of scale. So it's like interesting yeah, to kind of cool. see, yeah, see that great way to put it, right. It's, it's, you have to over a certain amount of time when you do enough deals and you, and you move through enough cards, you start to realize you have to take some of the emotion out. Right. right. It yeah. is a very emotional, Absolutely. very good advice. Yeah. Such an emotional space. This is right. such an emotional <laughs> industry. We love yeah. cards. We love them. <laughs> we actually love them. Yeah. So yeah. to move them is is a mental, it's a mental leap. Right. Um, but you make right. that leap enough, it starts to become, you know, muscle memory. So yeah. uh, I 100% agree. That's awesome. Wow. Chris, you have like a like a sentimental PC moving off some of the high roller stuff. <laughs> yeah, the the sentimental stuff for me is always Brady, uh, and and it's tough because like Brady's market is the market right now. Yeah, right? Right. and it's weird for me to say like my sentimental mar sentimental market is Brady's market, but like I grew up watching Tom Brady. Mm -hmm. You know, I was in middle school watching Tom Brady win Super Bowls, and I was in middle school going to the parades. And nice. like he became my, you know, idol. And that's just a product of me living and growing up where I grew up. I grew up right in this, in the heart of new England. And, you know, I was very, very lucky to be a part of, 
a part of like I was in the locker room, but like I was a very long <laughs> <Sure. laughs> the thing that he did on the football field, you know? And, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I, I think generally that's always where like my emotions take me outside of being a baseball collector, mm. um, you know, and as a baseball collector, Ken Griffey was it. Oh yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Oh yeah. For all of us. <laughs> oh, yeah, 89 okay. upper deck. Yeah. 89 awesome. upper deck. The 89 Tiffany is, is always like right. a, a dream card of mine. And, you yeah. know, I've, I've, I've had a couple of them now. And again, the emotion, they, they move. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. But, you know, uh, 89 Griffey Tiffany will always be a card that like, if I had to leave this industry and walk away with a box of cards, that would be it. Nice. Wow. Nice. 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 Yeah, it's funny you say that because when I got back into the hobby around the same time as you four or five years ago, the first card I bought again was when you know when I had disposable income was the eighty nine upper deck <laughs> PSA ten. Yeah, yeah, love it's it. Great love card. It. He's got such a baby face, right? It's like the <laughs> curry. Like, it's like the the curry rookie. I know. It's yeah. got that lore because it's like, who the hell is that? Yeah, who's that kid? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it, with Griffey and his face and how young he looks in that card, it's so iconic. iconic for it's sure. Just, it obviously, and it's at the crux of like a huge shift that happened yeah. in this case, right? right? Like the 89 Griffey was like, that was the tipping point. Mm. So many of right, them. Right, right, right. <laughs> it's why everything imploded. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, that's right. That was the catalyst. It's yeah. like the iconic card. That we all love, but it also like dismantled an entire. <laughs> <day>. <laughs> uh, so funny. true, so true. All right, yeah, it's great. All right, uh, if you don't mind, Chris, we'd like to just wrap up this interview with five quick fire questions. We appreciate your time, of course, and um, yeah, if we could just ask you these five quick fire questions, all related to hobby in some way, that'd be great. You ready for for that? Okay, okay. hot seat. Here we all go. Right. Well, uh, yeah. All right, here we go. Number one, what's your favorite sports card you currently own and why? Tom Brady Refractor, uh, Brady's only chrome parallel in existence. <laughs> nice. nice. Okay. Amazing. That's true. Amazing. Number two, what's your holy grail card? Ooh. I hate to stay on the Tom Brady train. The Tom, <laughs> Brady, <laughs> Tom Brady championship ticket contenders. Of course. Of course. All right. Okay. Sticker autos. Get rid of them or you don't mind them? Uh, don't love them, but need them. Okay. Can you expand on that? Yeah. I think it's, it's so difficult to produce sports cards mm. and have autographs, uh, at scale without stickers. I think right. it also increases the value of on-card autographs. Right. So on-card autographs become that much more important with Got stickers. In the game. Okay. Right. Understood. Good answer. Number four, coolest fellow collector you met in the hobby. Ooh, coolest fellow collector I've met in the hobby. Or one of. One of. Uh, my, my best friend in this industry is, is Mike at, at MC Sports Cards. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Mike is insanely inspirational in how he does business. He's mm. uh, you know a young kid that has built an empire and has one of the most insane collections on the planet, but also runs this as a business that I've built a lot of what we do around. So Mike is just... Uh, is one of the coolest out there. Nice. Shout out to MC Sports Cards. Shout All out right. MC. <laughs> and lastly, number five, being from Toronto on our podcast, we love talking about Vladdy. We love talking about Bichette. Are we homers or are they both legit? They're both legit. Both <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Love it. Um, <laughs> I think you guys are in an insane spot. It's incredible what uh, the, the amount of talent that Toronto has right now, the amount of young talent that Toronto has. I think Vlad is uh, generational talent. I think, yeah. you know, he overcame a lot of doubts this past mm -hmm. season. Bo is in his shadow and I think is just as talented. Yeah. If not more, Agreed. Like, Agreed. so dynamic, so incredibly talented. And then, you know, the other young guys are on that roster, you know, I think are, are studs. So mm -hmm. Fernandez and Vigio and it's, yeah. 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 Watch out though, the Red Sox. No, <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know, it's funny because I always promote, I always push uh, Rafael Devers, one of my favorite players. Happy Scoops, baby. That's my man. <laughs> <laughs> These guys know. These guys know. Yeah. He's got to, uh, you know, he's got to 
maybe include some salads or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, you don't want to be, let, let him be like Pablo Escobar, right? So. <laughs> no, 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 no. Or, oh, sorry, Panda. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You... We definitely yeah. don't want him to be like Pablo Escobar. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. We don't want him to be like the Panda. True. Both, yeah. both are. Either of would be good options. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I stand corrected. All right, Chris, really appreciate your time. And we look uh, forward to connecting again with you soon. Yeah, guys, thanks for having me. Awesome. I uh, had, had a blast. And uh, I'll talk to you all soon. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, thanks man. man. Thanks, Chris. Nice you. All right, buddy. All right, that was a great interview with Chris. You know, I think, um, yeah, he's well-spoken. You can obviously tell he loves the hobby. Any, any initial thoughts from you guys after that interview? Well, for me, you know, like I'm, I'm a big uh, a believer, I guess, in entrepreneurs in general, right? Like I, yeah. I myself am an entrepreneur and, you know, I've, uh, I've gotten uh, to be a part of a few startups, you know, over the last, you know, few years. So seeing this in the card industry, this is exactly what we need. We need uh, people like Chris to really um, be industry leaders, essentially, and, and solve those problems, uh, come up with solutions to those problems that industries have in particular, right? So it's like a, a lot of us, we could say, oh, the industry needs this or the industry needs that, but we, we don't really do anything about it, right? But uh, just seeing and witnessing, you know, Costa, what he's doing uh, out in, in the New England area, it's pretty, pretty damn amazing to see. Yeah, I'll tell you that. Yeah. 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 Agreed. yeah really well spoken, really well spoken dude, man. Like, yeah, he's definitely inspirational. You can tell, like, just his his intelligence and how focused he is on what he talks about. Um, you can see why he's been so so successful so far. Yeah, I I love that he brought in the the technology bit too because that's what we've been yeah. talking about. A lot can change in yeah. the industry because of the technology, and that's what exactly is needed, right? So yeah, yeah. No, that was fun. Hopefully, that's the first of many interviews for us. We love connecting with people in the hobby, and he was a great one to start off with. So. Thanks, Chris. Um, and we'll end off this episode as we normally do with our regular segment, Pick One. And this week, it's our Hot Takes edition. So that's when we take two hot takes, pit it against each other, and then we debate which one's more likely to happen or which one we think is more true. All right. So, Hyung, you usually always start us off. So are you ready okay. to Yeah, let's do yours? it. Um, and, you know, I always bring it up because I it's usually a problem I'm faced with. Or something that I'm mm -hmm. always fighting myself and I always, you know, see it and it's usually 50-50, believe it or okay. not. But maybe uh, maybe we'll see. So so basically paper parallels are better than chrome parallels. Okay. I'm gonna <laughs> pair that up. So when I say paper parallels, so for instance, like a we'll we'll say um uh not numbered a tops no a tops a tops paper parallel like a independence day right. out of seventy six. Oh, okay a paper parallel uh, versus mm -hmm. a tops chrome let's just say a gold refractor out of 50 oh, right see. so it's same value we're talking paper parallels are better than chrome parallels right versus ssp so super short print image variations are better than number rare flagship cards i know that's a little confusing so i'll give you an example like yeah. the acuna white jersey mm -hmm. right is an SSP, very low print run, super short print. It's an image variation. Or would you have like a, a numbered US 250 flagship rookie card, right? That has the same value. So right. SSP image variations are better than numbered flagship cards. Right. So it's paper parallels are better than chrome parallels versus SSP image variations are better than numbered rare flagship cards. Ooh. Mm. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> Uh, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go with paper parallel over chrome is more truer in the in the two two hot takes. I feel like paper parallel mm. is already better than than chrome. I could be wrong on pricing, but man, the, yeah, uh, the, the hobby says differently. Right, right. <laughs> they love they love they love the chrome parallels. Yeah, that's why I brought I mean, it up. I, I, guess, I love. Paper I guess it would be like select because I don't think. Mother's Day and Father's Day are too popular for something that's so low numbered. Right. But Independence Day and like Black, for example, and Black. Like, oh my goodness, yeah. those those command some crazy prices. I'm, I, yeah, I'm gonna go with paper. Like I like specifically ID Independence Day and Black. The parallels, man. Um, especially Soto, like the Soto Acuna years, man. Those cards just pop so nicely. Yeah, the 2018. Yeah. So I'm, and you know, paper is. 
I think what gives so much lure to the paper parallels is that it's just so tough to grade, right? I know I know Chrome sure. is also like their gem rates are pretty low as well, but I, I'm pretty sure paper is a lot lower. Like if you look at some of this year's, like I, I randomly looked up like Louis Robert Independence Day, his flagship image, and it's like I think like 20 were submitted and what there's like one PSA 10, right? Yeah, so like the, the gem hard. rates are really yeah. tough. So I think I'm gonna go with paper over the Chrome. Okay. I'm going with the SSP image variation. Um, you, you mentioned that the hobby sets Chrome parallels are are better. I, hobby's right, man. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> love the gold refractors. Yeah. Love the atomic. Oh man, I mean, like paper parallels, like like the Independence Day and and such. Like I feel like those are the exception right, right. to the rule, in my opinion. Right. So an SSP image variations. I mean, like those are tough to hit like mm-hmm. that they're ssp for a reason sssp you know what I mean? like they're right right they're they're rare even though they aren't numbered and you and you know no one will no one will argue that point you know the rarity of that even though they're not numbered so for me um yeah i think it's easier for me ssp image variations better than numbered rare flagship nice. cards In- interesting what's a, yeah this is tough what's ssp what's that? print runs it's usually like what 300, 300 um, cards so like? So, so SSP on the Acuna white jerseys are like 300, 300. for instance, right? right? So it's like, uh, having like a US 250 Independence Day, uh, uh, Acuna is out of 76, right? So you're going to have a very, a more rare card on, a, on that numbered. And that's the, the reason why I asked this too is like, I still don't know. I, like, I have, I have both. I've, I've always liked paper parallels better than Chrome, but for me, um, it was, Acuna white jersey or an uh like Acuna in the Independence Day which one would you rather mm-hmm. have and that's that's why I I actually sold the Acuna white jersey we were talking to Costa about it yeah. he pulled that up the white yeah, jersey yeah. and I was like that's one card I regret selling yeah. right is the white jersey PS, PSA 10 but I ended yeah. up getting the Independence Day um mm-hmm. uh but that's the numbered flagship car, like a rookie card that I would rather have long term actually so that I actually picked uh, I rather have uh, the nu- the numbered rare flagship uh, uh, over the SSP. So mm-hmm. I'm gonna go paper parallels are better than Chrome parallels. <laughs> okay, two to one. Yeah. All right, yeah. that's a good one. Nice. That's a good one. John, you got yours. Yeah, I do. <clears throat> so of of existing like current players right now in, in MLB, uh, I I believe Trout and Pools hold the most MVPs at three MVPs each. So my 1v1 hot take is going to be Soto ends his career with four MVPs or Shohei Otani ends his career with four MVPs. Now, Shohei is, for some context, Shohei is 27 years old. He's a little bit older. Uh, Soto is 23. He's not even, you know, you can say he's not even entering his prime. Uh, Otani is injury prone, but at this point, he looks like he is MVP automatic. So... Who's gonna end? Who's gonna Who's gonna do it? Um, I'll go first because it's it's the easy one for me. Soto's gonna be the four time MVP. Um, <laughs> just because we talked about we talked about this in previous episodes, I don't know if Shohei can uh, repeat his historic season maybe once or twice, but four times or three more times. If, like we're gonna assume that he's gonna win MVP this year. Um, yeah, he's got to stay healthy, and he, that's been an issue so far. He put it together this year. But who knows if he could do it for three more seasons, let alone, you know, one. So, um, or the other way around. So, yeah. So, I, I think Soto, and he, I feel like even Soto, Mr. Consistency, he played for a bad Nationals team. And look at the stats. It's ridiculous. Yeah, right? Amazing. Like, so, so Soto is, uh, I'm putting my money on Soto. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go with uh, Soto as well for me. It's, it, I, he might do it by the time he's 30. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I mean this guy's this guy's a monster. Whether it's a batting title or an MVP, he's he's gonna be a front runner every year, in my opinion. He's he's like I said, he's the greatest hitter that we've seen in our generation, period. Just flat out, if we're talking pure hitter, I th- I, I don't know anybody that's even close other than like a Vladdy. Uh but I still think uh, Soto is that pure uh that pure hitter, like a Ted Williams type player that we haven't seen, you know, in Ever really, uh, so uh, I like I said, like Clark said, I I don't see uh, uh, Otani being able to replicate it 
consistently. I hope he does because you know I I truly believe believe in Otani still, but I just think Soto's just too damn good, and there's too much time for him. Uh, and he's he's almost there, isn't he? Halfway there, maybe. <laughs> Man, I um I came right down to the wire to come up with this this question, so I didn't get a chance to think of it myself, but. <laughs> Now I'm thinking, man, I think it was a stupid 1v1 because... I know. No, no, it's no, not. I know it's good, but I, like, it's just, just, looking, it, 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 just looking at it, like Otani's 27. He's going to need to get like three MVPs in the next five years, which is pretty tough. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's quite boring, but I, I think it's, it's, it's got to be Soto. He's got, he's got two... Yeah. It's kind of like similar to when I picked Tiger winning a master over LeBron winning... Uh, two rings like Soto's got the time on his hand Otani's running out of time to get to that mark so I think the safer bet is Soto and these I mean both these guys are monsters but yeah I, I think the time on Soto's hands is, is going to be the, the factor you know what it's not that stupid like if if Shohei if you guaranteed me Shohei's health like he has a what chance. he's doing he's got a yeah, what he's doing yeah. as a pitcher and a batter like no one no one else is yeah. doing that right yeah. so if you guarantee me his health it's four MVPs, yeah, it's not not out of the ordinary, or it's not ex- extraordinary right. for me to hear that. I mean, they could technically both do it too, right? Yeah, true. Yeah. true. And that's auto Hall of Fame, by the way. Yeah, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. All right. Um, okay, my uh, hot takes edition of pick one is uh, we heard this before. Panini select from I think Jeff Wilson of Sports Card Investor. Um, he mentioned it last year, I believe, that he thinks P- Panini select basketball might overtake. Panini Prism basketball as the set to collect that will be worth more um, because it seems to be more rare than Prism cards. But for whatever reason, Hobby Logic Prism is still king in basketball. But my 1v1 is do you think select basketball will eventually be worth more than Prism basketball in general, uh, rookie cards? Or I'm going to go to football. Do you think Optic Hollow football rookie cards will be worth more than Prism football rookie cards? Mm-hmm. Again, over there, Prism football rookie cards are, are number one. But you know, Optic Hollow, it's are pretty sweet. So, oh, that's you- uh, yeah. I I'm I'm gonna go uh with my initial initial gut is select basketball will be worth more than Prism. Uh, I I I truly believe that. I think you kind of see a glimpse of it with Courtside. Uh, I know that's a it's a different base set, but it still falls under the select brand, and I think that's giving right. it uh especially respect in that in the basketball. Hopefully, they don't ruin it via the print run, but. Uh, I just don't see Optic Hollow Football overtaking a Silver Prism um, mm. just because, I mean, you look at Mahomes pricing right now, uh, they're, they're, they're at an all-time low probably in the last like couple yeah. years, but it's, it, it's 50%. The Optic Hollows are 50% of the Prism. I think uh, where I, I love Optic though because the, it is so rare. I think it's different in football because Prism is like the a silver prism of home is pretty rare it's not like you, you can get them anywhere either right so i think uh the rarity it's it, it's too it's, prism football is too rare still i think it could happen if it was basketball but i don't see it in football happening optic hollow not taking it so mm-hmm. i yeah i have to go on the other side and say select basketball will be worth more than prism because i do believe one day it will <laughs> okay yeah i like i love optic hollow uh, I think it's going to have a hard chance at beating Prism in football. But with that being said, I think the new select, I think Panini, you know, perhaps Panini already knew because this, the newest product came out before they lost the, the you yeah. know, they unofficially lost the license. license. But perhaps they already knew that and they just decided, you know what, well, let's just print <laughs> the crap out of this product and go nuts. And I think that really affected the brand, man. And I, even if when I kind of look at select pricing, um, I don't know. I don't. I don't trust that Select is ever anymore going to t- overtake, especially the damage that was done this mm. year in terms of like market perception. And then when you look at Select, the product itself, I love Courtside. I think you know Courtside is you know it's SSP, so it's going to be better than Prism Base. But I feel like Courtside within Select kind of cannibalizes. I think Select kind of cannibalizes its own value. So like because co- people just draw to Courtside. I think they just can't view Concourse as something that is super desirable or, you know, better than Prism or better than like Optic, you know, whatever, right? Because I, I just think if you're looking at Select, you're just going to naturally gravitate towards Courtside. And, you know, like Premier and Concourse kind of get left in the wind. So I, I don't, 
you know, all that being said, I don't believe Select. I used to. I think I was on that same camp as Jeff Wilson in believing Select was yeah. on a trajectory to beat Prism. No faith anymore. So because of that, I'm, <laughs> I have to default back and I'm going to choose Optic Hollow. Nice. Yeah. Okay. I thought it was going to be a sweep, Select over Prism. But you know what? Johnny, you convinced me. I'm staying. Ho- op- My initial was Optic Hollow as well. <laughs> really? And for, the, and I was, for the same reason that you said about Select this year screwing up the brand a little bit by just doing too too many too many parallels yeah. right and yeah. and um I, I i personally optic hollow football rookie cards just look so way nice. better and, and the, the, than, the, I agree. than photos and stuff prism silver yeah. Yeah. yeah it's it's like consistent in a way and it's it's just a it's a great picture like i love them posing especially the qbs yeah. and you know it's one area where i think Right now, it's like hobby logic that Prism football is just uh, worth more. But I think, I don't know, over time, I, I believe in the people. I believe in the people that are going to see, like, at the Optic Hollow, like, hey, wait a minute, this looks way better than the yeah. Prism football card. Yeah. Whereas Prism basketball, like, people are diehards about Prism basketball. So I think I think it's going to take more to have um, select, even with the issues that you brought up, John, um, overcome Prism. So, yeah. yeah. For me, it's optic hollow football who will one day be worth more than the prism football. Yeah. But it's a good point you mentioned about Mahomes, Young. Like it is rare to begin with, so that might make it harder. But yeah, but time will tell. We'll see. This is a hot takes edition for a reason. Yeah. These are all hot takes. <laughs> so, hey man, we're going to the so, cartoon in a couple of days. Optic hollow Mahomes, man. Let's go. I yeah, know, look I, for one. Uh, yo, I'm looking at the eBay's. It's under three thousand. It's under three thousand. So, oh, nice. What? PSA That's ten. Time yeah. to, it's time to Holy buy. Cow. Yeah. yeah. If I see one for under three at the show, I might have to pull. Hey, it. I might, we'll I might be it. there with you, man. I might be there with you. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not kidding. That's crazy. All right. We'll talk a little bit more about the show next week when we go this week by the time this airs. But yeah, this was a great show. Of course, thanks one more yeah. time to Chris for joining us on the pod. Um, love hearing your thoughts. And, um, and yeah, we'll hope to connect with him soon whenever we're in the Boston area. Next time, we'll definitely have to check out Card Vault, which looks amazing. Yeah, absolutely. But, um, sure. Yeah. And thanks again for all our listeners and our subscribers. If you haven't done so already, we're on Apple Podcasts, we're on Spotify, and and um, wherever you listen to your podcasts, we appreciate any feedback and um, five-star reviews if you like the show. But yeah, until next time, we'll see you again on Tuesday. Bye. Hey, thanks for listening to Cards to the Moon. We'd really appreciate you subscribing to our podcast wherever you listen to your podcasts. And you can also connect with each of us on Instagram at 5 Card Guys, or you can follow Hyung at Integrity Sports Cards, or John at Trade You at Recess. You can also check us out at 5CardGuys.com. Thanks again, and hope to connect soon.